Hello everyone, my name is Bashar. This week we will be talking about temperature measurement. Before going into the details of experimental procedure, it is important to get familiar with the topic. For that purpose, I will try to explain the importance of temperature measurement, where and why do we need to use such measurements. Of course, especially for us metallurgical and materials engineering students, it is important to understand how can we measure a temperature of a material and different type of measurement methods. We have been using temperature measurement methods for a very long time. The most important areas related to our department are industry, military, experimental purposes and household appliances. In industry, temperature measurement is crucial because temperature determines most of the material properties during casting, heat treatment or steel making processes. Having a control over temperature gives us a control over its microstructure, uh, which in the end affects the material property. For military purposes, as you know, we have thermal cameras, infrared detectors and so on that can give detailed information about certain terrains and or, or environments. We also have many temperature sensors that, sensors that can monitor our household appliances, computers, ovens and so on. However, our main focus will be on the experimental purpose. In order to understand the experimental purpose, we need to define basic concepts first, such as heat and temperature. Heat is the energy that can be transferred between objects with three main different mechanisms, conduction, convection and radiation. Temperature, on the other hand, is the measure of this energy on a macro level. As you know, there are several different units used for temperature and we mostly use Celsius or Kelvin. These units are defined by scientists using different approaches. In 1889, Joseph Lambert tried to plot pressure of several different gases versus temperature. He saw the decrease in the pressure of the gas when it is cooled down. After he made several experiments with different gases, he saw that there is a point on the temperature axis that the pressure lines meet when the pressure becomes theoretically zero. He found this point as minus 270 Celsius. However, when the technology has advanced, scientists could achieve more accurate results. This point is called absolute zero as we call it today, which is minus 273.15 Celsius degrees or zero Kelvin. After defining the temperature unit, we can now talk about temperature measurements using different approaches. What we basically need is a material or a device that changes its properties as a result of a temperature change. If we know the change in the material beforehand, we can define the temperature numerically. Thanks to this approach, we can use materials that change its volume, density, resistance, voltage or color with respect to a temperature change. For the purpose of this experiment, we will talk about the change in voltage, uh, which is the main working principle of thermocouples. We can also divide temperature measurement methods as direct methods or indirect methods. When you consider direct methods, as the name implies, there is a contact between the temperature measurement device and the object, whereas in the indirect method, there is no contact in between. Basic thermometers, thermocouples, are one of the examples for direct methods. Optical pyrometers, infrared detectors and thermal cameras are the examples for indirect methods. Let's talk about thermocouples in detail now. Uh, the working principle of thermocouples are based on Seebeck effect. In thermocouples, we use two chemically different metal wires that are connected at one end, as you can see on the screen, as T-sense. This part is what we call hot junction, that is placed near the object that we want to measure the temperature of. On the other end, the wires are extended to T-reference. This part is called cold junction. After that, the wires are met at a potentiometer to measure the voltage across them, the reason for the existence of a voltage across the wire uh, is the slight shift of the electron energy levels in different materials. That is why we use wires that have a different composition to generate electromotive force or EMF. Covering up all this information, let me give you a brief information about our experiment. We have a small amount of tin metal placed inside the furnace that is heated above its melting point. We will shut down the furnace and let the liquid tin cool down slowly. During this part, we will collect data from our potentiometer 
and find corresponding temperature inside the furnace and try to obtain its cooling curve. What we need to do after plotting temperature versus time is to comment on the material's purity, transformation temperature, cooling rate and so on. There are several different important points on cooling curve. Consider the theoretically drawn cooling curve of a liquid metal. The AB line is the cooling line of the liquid. Upon reaching point B, which is actually the transformation or the solidification temperature, the liquid to solid transformation does not start yet because the liquid and solid states are both at equilibrium at the same time. In order to drive the liquid to transform into solid, we need to decrease the temperature more. This driving force is called undercooling and it is represented as BC line. After having enough driving force for the nucleation of the first solid particles, the temperature starts to increase to reach the solidification temperature. This part is called recalescence. Depending on the amount of liquid that you have, the transformation is carried out for an extended amount of time as DE line shown in the figure. This is called isothermal solidification or thermal arrest. In the end, when all of the liquid is transformed into solid, the cooling continues to reach the equilibrium temperature with the surroundings. We can also find out the corresponding cooling rates change in temperature with respect to the change in time of both liquid and solid states. In our experiment, we will try to observe all these important points using thermocouple systems that is attached in a furnace that includes a small amount of tin inside the glass chamber. The thermocouple system we will use in our experiment is a K-type thermocouple. In this type, we have chromel and alumel alloy wires. However, there are several other thermocouple types used in the industry depending on the temperature range or the atmospheric conditions. You can see another type of thermocouple which is platinum and platinum rhodium alloy thermocouple in the figure. These types of thermocouples are used at very high temperatures since the platinum has a very high melting point. However, since platinum is expensive, the amount of wire that is attached inside the thermocouple has a thickness similar to a human hair. Other than thermocouples, we have many different devices used in the steel industry. Some of them are even capable of measuring the chemical content such as amount of carbon, oxygen, sulfur, manganese of the steel, of the molten steel, which is extremely crucial during production. Now let's move on to the experimental setup. The experimental setup consists a glass tube seen on the left hand side placed inside the furnace. Inside this glass tube we have our sample and the hot junction. This glass tube is placed inside the furnace from the opening above the furnace and the wires are extended to a point what I explained earlier as cold junction. These wires then continue over our on off switch and the temperature control unit to meet our potentiometer. All the connections are controlled to make sure that there is no short circuits or disconnected points. As you can notice, the cold junction remains in the air, which can be assumed to be at room temperature. So before starting the experiment, we measure the room temperature using a thermometer in our laboratory as 28 or 27 degrees Celsius and note it down. This measurement is important because the reference table for K-type thermocouple is generated when the cold junction was at 0, uh, 0 Celsius degrees which can be kept constant using ice water mixture. Uh, in order to find the correct temperature value, we need to make a correction procedure because the cold junction in our case is at room temperature, not at zero Celsius. For this purpose, we find the corresponding voltage value for 28 degrees Celsius from the table and note it down, which is 1.08 or 1.08 millivolts. Think of it this way. The amount of voltage we measure from our potentiometer is actually smaller due to less temperature difference. Because of this, we need to add this amount of millivolts to our every single data point to achieve the correct potential difference. The furnace was switched on and preheated one hour before the lecture starts about the melting point of tin. About an hour later, the furnace reaches the defined temperature. After explaining the correction procedure, we shut down our furnace to cool it down slowly. We also measure the time in order to collect data each 30 seconds. 
After collecting data about 25 minutes and making sure the data collection is done properly, we stop taking data and finish the experiment. From this point, you are required to draw the cooling curve of the sample properly and discuss the points covered in the lecture in your reports. So if you consider cooling curves, we can apply these cooling curves on different types of uh, phase diagrams. The first one I will talk about is the binary isomorphous, isomorphous phase diagram, which is similar to this. Uh, the melting point of A is defined as 800 degrees Celsius, and the melting point of B is at 1000 degrees Celsius, and they have complete solubility on each other. So let's try to draw cooling curves at different compositions for this type of phase diagram. So let's say we will begin with uh, drawing the phase, I mean the cooling curve for pure A component. So what we will have is we cool from the liquid part and reach the phase transformation temperature of A, which is 800 degrees Celsius, and cool it to room temperature. So what we'll have is a drop in cooling in the liquid phase, and we will have undercooling and the thermal arrest, and then we will have a cooling curve similar to this. So this is 800 degrees Celsius. Okay. So this part is liquid. This part is where we have liquid to solid phase transformation region for A component, and then we have solid A that is cooling down to room temperature. So let's say another component or another composition which is at 0.5% B corresponding to this phase diagram and we will start from liquid phase again. What we will have this time is that we don't have a constant temperature change but a range of temperature for the phase transformation. Since we don't know the cooling rates, I'm just randomly drawing the cooling rates according to these regions. So for the first region, again it's liquid, and for the second region we will have liquid plus alpha this time, because we are entering the alpha region, and then after that we will have alpha again. And the corresponding temperatures for these uh, regions will be found from the phase diagram. Let's say this is 950 degrees Celsius and this is 850. Okay, so this will be 950, and this will be 850. So another type of phase diagrams that we can have is a eutectic phase diagram. And let's try to draw a cooling curve with different compositions from this diagram now. Uh, let's try with a simple one and choose eutectic composition. Let's say this is 0.4% B, and we are trying to draw the cooling curve for this composition. Again we are starting from liquid and we have a reaction occurring at 500 degrees Celsius which is the eutectic reaction. For that reaction we need a certain amount of time to complete this reaction that's why we will have a constant temperature and then after that we will have cooling of the phases. So what are the phases for, for this type of composition is that at first we will have a liquid region Upon reaching uh, 500 degrees Celsius, we will have a reaction, that is eutectic reaction, and that reaction we will have liquid transforming into alpha plus beta, because we are in entering alpha plus beta region, and then we only have alpha plus beta. Don't forget to uh, indicate the undercooling for the reactions to occur. Okay, so let's try to pick another composition from this diagram. Let's say we are trying to draw uh, 0.6 let's say percent B so at first we will have liquid again and upon reaching this temperature let's call it 650 degrees Celsius we will have uh, beta particles that is precipitating in the liquid state and then we will again have a eutectic reaction at 500 degrees Celsius so what we will have is that we have liquid region we have a change in the slope because we have a precipitation region and then we will have undercooling for the eutectic reaction and we, can, we will again have a certain amount of time and then we will have cooling. For these regions, let's call this one liquid because above that we only have liquid. In between we have liquid plus beta and at the reaction we will have liquid transforming into alpha plus beta again 
and then afterwards we will have only alpha plus beta. The temperatures 650 degrees and 500 degrees. So this is for 0.6 weight per cent P.